The Lord be with you. Let us stand and pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Uh, Welcome. Good to see all of you here. Well, we will go ahead and get right into the, uh, the class, which is an introduction to the Anglican tradition. Should have a handout um, here, and it gives you kind of the overview of the classes. We'll come back to, to that in just a little bit. So, imagine you're new to the Anglican tradition. You walk in here, you don't know anything about anything. Uh, what, what clues do you think you'd pick up on to try to figure out what this Anglican thing is? What things might stand out to you? This can be a rhetorical question or it can be an open question for answering if you prefer. Kneeling for prayer. Well, let's imagine you actually, we didn't kneel for prayer though. What did we do? We stood. That still would be kind of strange, right? So if you went to church, you'd definitely see that. But just in here, you, you would have noticed that. Yeah. I think of churches now as the other half. Uh, well, but it, okay, yeah. What's that? Yeah, so if we actually went into the church, you would see the kind of physical architecture, and we're going to talk about that later. That's right, yeah. But imagine, I'm talking about this room that you just walked this into. Is, yeah. Okay, yeah, a big, big old cross hanging up there. You guys hear that? There's no corpus. That's interesting. Whereas if you went over to the church, you'd see the corpus. Then you might be confused. Why is there no corpus, corpus? Yeah. Right. The collars, two collars in the room, plus black clothing. For me, if I remember back in my pre-Anglican days, if I walked into a church function, there was a bottle of wine in the middle of the room. I would have thought, huh. I mean, I distinctly actually remember the first time I was at a church function, and there were these uh, little old blue-haired ladies mixing drinks. And I was just like, that totally was a, was a clash of things. <laughs> I remember being like, oh, this is great, but also confusing. What is going on here? You might pay some attention to the art and, and think, well, that's weird. Why is there a bleeding lamb on a table? I don't know what that's about. You'd see some angels swinging some, some, some things, whatever those are. Uh, you would have noticed maybe the statue of Jesus walking in. If, you were, if, if, if it was light enough, and you paid attention to the church, the outside of the church, you might have noticed there's stained glass, which you could kind of see there. The call and response before the standing to prayer, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Uh, When I taught at a mostly Presbyterian school, I always started my class that way. I never told anybody how to respond. I just threw out the Lord be with you. And it was fun because there were a couple kids from the Anglican church, and they'd say, and with thy spirit. And then the Roman Catholics would say, and with your spirit. And then the Episcopalians would say, and also with you, and the Baptists would just stare at you. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting, everybody's got their, their, different, their different backgrounds they're, they're coming out of. Well, there's a lot of places you could start, and we'll hit, we'll hit on all of those. We're going we're gonna to do a tour of the church eventually. Um, we're going to talk about moral, living, moral life in the Anglican tradition. We're going to talk a little bit about ordination and um, the, the theology of ordination that, that sets those who are ordained apart. But I want to start with what we started with, which is, which is the prayer that we started with. Uh, every, uh, what is the name of this prayer? Does anybody know? Yeah, this is called the Colic for Purity, and probably most of you recognize it as the prayer at the opening of the Mass. That's right. The very first thing we do is exactly what we just did. Uh, well, the first sort of official prayer is the Colic for Purity. The celebrant says, the Lord be with you. People respond with thy spirit, and then you launch into this prayer. Probably all know this already, but it's called a collect, which is the noun form of collect. And uh, you may or may not know that that's a, that, that, that change in pronunciation to denote noun versus verb when it's two syllables is actually a very common thing in English once you start to notice it. So you record a record. You conflict over a conflict. The emphasis is on the first syllable when it's a noun and on the second syllable when it's a verb, collect. So now you know that. I just think that is a totally useless and interesting little tidbit. It's called a collect because it collects people together in a common prayer, and it, um, it also often sort of collects the theology of, of the service together 
um, in the prayer. So when you look at the collect for purity there, what stands out or what do you learn or what does it teach you? What's, what's, what, when you think about the fact that this is the first thing we say every time we have a Eucharistic service, that, that tells you it's important. So what, what does it teach us? You can't hide anything from God. What does that teach you about God? He knows all. He's all-knowing. The fancy term for that is omniscience, which some of you, I'm sure you know. He is all-knowing. The character traits of God are sort of all connected, and so his all-knowingness, his omniscience, is connected to his omnipotence, his all-powerfulness, and his omnipresence, uh, the fact that he is everywhere, which is, which is really just another way of saying that he transcends space and time. God is not so much one being among many, but he is uh, the ground of existence. He is that thing uh, St. Paul says, quoting, I can't remember who, a pagan philosopher or a pagan poet, uh, he is uh, that being in whom we live and move and have our being. All existence is rooted in God. So the very first thing we do in Mass is we actually declare the character of God. So there's this statement, this rather profound statement of who God is. In one sense, it's sort of simple and obvious, and, and every, every, every child who grows up in the church hopefully sort of knows that. And on the other hand, it's sort of the most radical thing that you could, that you could say about God, that he knows all. There is absolutely nothing hid from him. Yes, Zachary said there's purpose to love and to magnify, a.k.a. worship. And so it is love and worship are the ultimate purposes of the human being. And so this not only lays out in a very profound and basic sense who God is and his divine, divine omnipotence and who he is as Trinity, as, as Mindy said, it also connects that with our ultimate purpose in life, which is to love and worship. Yeah, excellent. So, okay, um, uh, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. And then what follows, just what Mindy said, is therefore, so you've started by pointing towards God and describing who God is, and then what happens? There's an implicit description of who you are, which is what? Someone in need of cleansing, right? To say that, to ask God to cleanse, your, cleanse the thoughts of your heart implies that the thoughts of your heart need cleansing. And so God's omnipotence is contrasted with human frailty and human sin, and then the recognition of the need to deal with it. What do we learn from, by, Mindy already said this, but by the inspiration of the whole, of thy Holy Spirit, what does that teach us? Or even the petition cleanse. The petition cleanse teaches us we need cleansing, but it also teaches us that we can't do it, right? We need to be cleansed, but we can't do the cleansing. God has to do the cleansing, and how is he going to do it? He's by the Holy Spirit, yeah. By the inspiration, the in-breathing is, is, is really what that means. That the Holy Spirit, what's that? Yeah, the breath of God, which is another, an image for the grace of God, infusing your life and enabling you to do what you could not do otherwise. And then, as Zachary said, then there's a purpose. That, in order that, we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Which again, love and worship, I think, are the final ends, the final purposes of human existence. That's a, in some ways, that's a really tight summary of what Catholics call the beatific vision, to look upon God in love and worship, which is where we are ultimately headed if we love God and pursue him. And the other thing that's, that's uh, on the one hand, there's the recognition that we cannot do it on our own. We need God to cleanse our hearts. We need the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And on the other hand is, I think, a very unabashed sense that nevertheless, with God and the grace of the Holy Spirit, we can perfectly love and worthily magnify. So there actually is a very not squeamish, not embarrassed, not apologetic sense that actually you can perfectly love God and you can worthily magnify God if you have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and, the gra and grace in your life. And so there's a recognition both of the sin and frailty of human beings, of the incapacity of human beings to please God without God, and yet the ability of human beings to please God, to love God, to worship God with God, with grace. And then it happens through Christ our Lord. So there's this Trinitarian notion threaded through it. If you pay attention to the prayer book collects uh, throughout the year, most of them are addressed to God the Father, almost all of them are, 
and almost all of them end with through Jesus Christ our Lord or with an invocation of the whole Trinity. So most prayers in the prayer book are to God the Father through Jesus Christ. And all of them implicitly, and many of them explicitly, you are doing so by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this is a, this is a sort of classic, it's, this is not unique to Anglicanism, it's just a classic um, Catholic, Orthodox, and Anglican way of understanding prayer, that you, do, that you pray to the Father through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And often that the Holy Spirit is explicitly mentioned, but often it's not, it's just clearly implied. Um, which I think is very appropriate to the place of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, where the Holy Spirit is present throughout Scripture, but often just by implication. The Holy Spirit is often below the surface. The Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to himself um, throughout Scripture. The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus um, and to the Father. As Jesus says to Nicodemus, this uh, the Spirit blows where it listeth, and you cannot see it, but you can, I'm totally botching that now, but you can see the, uh, the effects of it. There's also a very, there's a very classic prayer book movement here, which is you go from ascribing something to God to recognizing your need in light of who God is to a recognition, not just of your need for God, but of your need to do something as a result. And you're never doing something apart from God, but by God's grace, you then have an obligation to do something. So God knows all, therefore God needs to cleanse us. God needs to forgive us by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do what we have to do, perfectly love and worthily magnify. And, and this is very common in the prayer book, and it's the way that our confession, our prayer for confession um, works as well. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men. He's the maker and he's the judge. So what do you then do? You ask for forgiveness. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. Grant that we may ever hereafter, there we go. Grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee and love and newness of life. Yeah. So there is, again, that same movement. Who is God? He's the maker and judge. Therefore, we need forgiveness for our sins, and then we need to live in newness of life. So ascribing, describing God, petitioning God, and then our own obligation. This is a kind of a classic prayer book. Form, which is not unique, again, to the prayer book. The other thing that's worth noting is the pronouns. Who's doing the praying? We are, right? It doesn't say, cleanse the thoughts of my heart that I may perfectly love thee, right? And that's because this is common prayer. The Book of Common Prayer is common prayer. That means it's prayer that we do together. Private prayer, personal prayer, is a part of the Anglican tradition, but it's not a part of the Book of Common Prayer because it's literally a book of common prayer. Uh, and so sometimes people are like, well, there's no personal devotions in there. Well, it's the Book of Common Prayer. It's not the Book of Common Prayer and other prayers too. So, so there are other, there has always been in the Anglican tradition supplementary private devotional, devotional works. But there's also but the Book of Common Prayer is supreme over all of those, and so there is a sense that it is a fundamentally communal faith that we pray together, and that all of your individual personal devotions have to flow from and be connected to the common prayer life of the church. Yeah, I grew up in a tradition where the, the purpose of church was to sort of stimulate my individual personal worship of God, which is not wrong. That is a purpose of church, but it's really not an inwardly focused tradition. It's an outwardly focused tradition. You are being brought in to pray together, uh, not brought to sort of, you, there is an introspection there, right? Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts implies introspection, but you immediately are sort of turned back outside of yourself um, to, to pray communally. Liturgy as the work of the people or the act of the people is public, yeah. It's, it's to give worship that is worthy that he deserves exactly yeah and um i should have looked up there was a salt one of the psalms appointed this week for morning prayer is the one that says that no man no man can offer you worthy worship botching that entirely and so there's a sense in which in which we can't and yet by the power of the holy spirit we can um but the psalm says you you he's too great to actually have worship that is that it actually gets to his worthiness 
Uh, and, if, and I believe, you, I, was, I think this was just an evangel- in the book Evangelical is Not Enough, which some of us are reading, worship is actually connected to worth. It's, they have this share, the common thing. So to worship is to give worthy what is worth. So if you look at the front here again, you've got five sessions, and I've got sort of a title or a topic. The, book, the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer will be next time. The Church and Authority, Worship and the Beauty of Holiness. We'll talk about um, uh, architecture, music, uh, sacred art in, on that one, and then the sacramental life. Below that, I have uh, citations, which are from the Eucharistic liturgy, or also from the Bible, but, uh, but I pulled them from the Eucharistic liturgy. So we started with Almighty God unto whom all hearts are open. And then the second one, when we talk about the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer, I pulled from the summary of the law. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. And then uh, the church and authority, well, and authority, well, what is the church? It's a church that worships God with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. And then worship in the beauty of holiness and then the sacramental life. And those, those take, you, take us through the Eucharistic liturgy, from the opening acclamation to the proclamation of the gospel. That's part of what we call the liturgy of the word, the first half of the service that culminates in the sermon. And then in the second half of the service, that's the, the liturgy of the sacrament, which culminates in the Eucharist. Uh, and, and those are, are pulled from there. And then the last one is, is the, the um, prayer of humble access where we were right just before we take communion. So what does that tell you that I'm structuring it around the Eucharistic liturgy? What does that suggest, at least, that I believe about the Anglican tradition? That's right. The Eucharist is at the heart of what we do as Anglicans. That is the sort of center of our tradition. So the other thing, way back at the beginning that I forgot to mention, if you came out of my tradition, which is sort of a very generic, watery, evangelical, non-denominational Baptist-ish. It wasn't even like really Baptist. Like we were, I would have been very watery to the real Baptists. The other thing that would have been startling would be the fact that I clearly said a prayer that I was not coming up with extemporaneously, right? I was, I was saying a rote prayer, as I would have, is what I would have thought. Um, and using these and thous like I was, I don't know, highfalutin, <laughs> yeah, or something like that. And so there's a structure to our Eucharist that is the same. These words, every single Sunday, if you, you know, faithfully at- attend Mass, every single Sunday you will hear these words your entire life, and they will not change. Well, unless there's a prayer book revision, which is always possible. <laughs> Uh, we don't have to get into that. Uh, but, but in general, in general, these words are, are sort of very stable. Um, one of the things that's worth noting, uh, sometimes we talk about the, like the King James Bible and the liturgy of the prayer book as though that was the way people talked back then. And it's pretty, cl- we're pretty sure, some of this stuff is actually kind of hard, it's hard to know how people talked back then because Common people did not necessarily leave records behind of, of, what, of how they talked. But we're pretty sure for a variety of reasons that both the King James and the liturgy of, of the 16th and 17th centuries was not how the common people talked. And it was, in fact, an elevated liturgy. So, for instance, um, the King James consistently translates in the Old Testament when you run into the word 70, the King James con- consistently translates that three score and ten. Well, in the original Hebrew and the Septuagint Greek, it's just 70. There's no three score and 10. And and I I remember growing up, I like learning learning, um, the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago. Well, people just back in the 1800s, they just said four score all the time. That was just what they said. Nobody did that. That would be ridiculous. Nobody says three score and 10, they'd say 70. Like, why would you waste the time to say three score and 10 on a regular basis? Now, if you were trying to sound like the King James Bible, which is exactly what Abraham Lincoln was doing, you're trying to evoke a kind of liturgical text, in a sense, a liturgical language, then you would. But you wouldn't just go around and be like, uh, I'll give you three score and ten dollars for that cow. Nobody would have said that. And so, so the prayer book and the Bible are in an elevated register from the start. So 
it's more elevated now in a certain sense. It's more divorced from everyday life than it would have been hundreds of years ago. But even at that point, it was already removed from everyday life. And the great English poet um, W.H. Auden, when he was seeing drafts of what became the 1979 prayer book, and I'm not a huge 79 hater, I'm just a little bit of a 79 hater. Auden wrote, I think he, I can't remember if he wrote his rector, he wrote his bishop. It's sort of a famous and hilarious um, letter. But he has a line, he has a line there, he says, he says, Elizabethan English, Engl the English of the prayer book, is the perfect liturgical language because it's, it's, it's not hard to understand. There's a couple things here and there that you'll have to explain. Well, what is prevent? Prevent means go before. You know, Father Ralph said that the other day in the sermon. Prevent means go before. And there's a few other things where you have to explain things. But for most, uh, you know, native English speakers, it doesn't take long to figure out the prayer book language for the most part. And yet, it's so clearly removed from everyday language that you know within a sentence. You know, you can't get a sentence of the King James Bible out or a sentence of the prayer book liturgy out without knowing you're not talking to your buddy, you know, in the subway. We don't have a subway around here. I don't know why. I'm interested, a few minutes ago, you made a remark about the Eucharist being a descent of our Lord Jesus. How do you see the Eucharist? That's right. Yeah, so one of the things we may or may not well, it's, I would say it was still true. It was just true in a different way. So it wasn't, um, well, and it depends on where you go. You, you could still um, have that be the case. So it was very common in, um, in, various, in various sections of the Anglican Church not that long ago to, to do something like have three Sundays where actually all you had was morning prayer and you'd only have the Eucharist once. Uh, and it wasn't all that uncommon a couple hundred years ago to have the Eucharist quarterly. So you might have it every three months, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's relatively low church. We have churches in our diocese. I don't think we have any that do, do it only once a month, but we do have churches in our diocese that will alternate. And actually, now that I think about it, we do have one church that has multiple services, and in one of the services, they only have the Eucharist once a month. So that used to be very common. It's very, uh, it's increased, it became increasingly rare in the last 200 years, slowly. That was what was called the parish communion movement that, that moved the communion to a weekly service or even a daily service. Um, I would actually still say that, that even in those, one of the, so one of the objections that some had to making a weekly Eucharist was, the, was they were worried, wrongly in my opinion, but understandably, they were worried that having the Eucharist every week would make it common. And so part of the idea of having it once a month or once every three months is that it it's becomes really important. And, and I will also say that, that it was very common throughout the church's history, uh, medieval and back, for that we, they would have a weekly Eucharist, but people would not commune every, every weekly Eucharist. They would, um, they would come to the service, but they would not come up and receive. Uh, because receiving was something that people would sometimes take, you know, a couple months of preparation to prepare in order to receive. That's, that's not, if, you, if that's what's happening, that's not a lowered significance of the Eucharist. That's a different way of seeing the Eucharist as central. Now, we've moved to a parish communion model, which has its benefits and its downsides, um, and we could get into that another time, but we won't. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would bet in our diocese, that 20 years ago, it was probably 50-50 in terms of a weekly Eucharist versus, so. And, and actually, we don't, so, so did you hear what Minnie said, that some churches will have a morning prayer service that either there's a short gap between them, so you might have morning prayer and then 10 minute gap, but, but, but often they'll just be, there's actually in the, um, in the 1928 prayer book, there's a place that tells you, here's how to combine morning prayer and the Eucharist into one service. We actually, Anytime you go to a church that does an Old Testament and a psalm, they're actually shoehorning a little bit of morning prayer into the Eucharist. Because if you look at the 28, there's no rubric for doing what we do. It's just become this extremely common, is combining a little bit of morning prayer, the Old Testament and the psalm from morning prayer into the, the Eucharistic service. And our, in our, the, morning, the, the Old Testament and the psalm are taken from what's appointed for morning prayer reading. Uh, yes and no. Communion versus Eucharist are essentially um, 
identical terms. Eucharist is just Greek for the Thanksgiving, uh, for Thanksgiving, so it's a Thanksgiving offers. Communion, it's interesting, Holy Communion is, is often seen as like slightly more Protestant, the Eucharist slightly more Catholic, but communion, it's, the, the Catholic view of the Eucharist is that it is a sacrament of unity in which you commune with Christ and therefore with each other, and so communion is also a very, I'd say, very uh, appropriate and very Protestant and Catholic uh, view, way, to, way to describe it. The difference between the mass, so for starters, people get uncomfortable because mass is like sounds Roman Catholic. Well, it's just literally from the end of the, the Latin mass, it, he's, uh, the, the end of the dismissal, what, what for us is let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord, is it, he sends them out and it's missa est. Missa just means get out of here. <laughs> in Latin, it's different. Uh, and so, so there's nothing, it's not like mass is like a secret word for transubstantiation or something like that. It's just... But the distinction is, and it, and it is actually helpful, is that Holy Communion, even though we have an order for Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper that includes everything, properly speaking, the Eucharist, uh, Holy Communion refers to the Eucharist or the liturgy of the sacraments. The second half of the service is Holy Communion. So after the sermon, you go into the Holy Communion proper. Before that, you have the liturgy of the word where we read the Old Testament, the Psalm, the Epistle, the Gospel, and we, and we preach. And that's the liturgy of the word, and that's technically not, liturgically speaking, part of the Holy Communion service is attached to it. The Mass refers to both. But our prayer book, tradition, for hundreds and hundreds of years, uses it for both, and we do too. So when we talk about Holy Communion, we mean the whole thing. Um, when, if you say Holy Communion is at 1015, you aren't, like, getting the sermon out of the way before that. <laughs> um, so, so, one, so what, I what I would say before is that one thing that would have been interesting to me about the Collect for Purity is that it, that it was a set prayer, an established prayer, a prayer that sounded different, and that's when we started getting off on the rabbit trail, <laughs> different than, uh, than, than, than how normal everyday conversation goes. And so the other thing is, one, my organization here tells you that the Eucharist is at the heart of it. But we're not just going to talk about Eucharistic theology, we're going to take the Eucharistic liturgy and we're going to pull out and talk about the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer, because we proclaim the Bible in the middle of it. And so, but what I do think is also the case is that the, litur the liturgy, or rather liturgy, period, is at the heart of the Anglican tradition as well. So other traditions will have the, you know, the, the, in, the at the in the Presbyterian church, um, I mean, the Bible would be at the heart of, of their tradition. It's at the heart of ours too. But the, 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 the distinctive elements of the tradition would be expressed in the Westminster Confession. I would say the, that our, our authoritative source of doctrine ultimately is the Bible. That is the infallible ultimate authority over which nothing else can be. But it is the Bible authoritatively interpreted by, first of all, the creed, the Nicene Creed. That's why we say it right before every sermon. Uh, and so the creed is the authoritative interpreter of the Bible, which means, which is not that the creed is over the Bible, but the creed is the authoritative interpretation of the Bible. If you disagree with the creed, you're disagreeing with the Bible. That's the, the short version. You cannot... You cannot disagree with the Nicene Creed and get the Bible right. So if you're reading, and there's, I have a famous, not, probably this crowd would not, he would not be so famous, a very famous evangelical scholar. He was the editor of the uh, ESV Study Bible, not the ESV itself, but the Study Bible, the general editor. Uh, and for a little while, he didn't believe in part of the Nicene Creed because it didn't fit with what he saw in the Bible. Eventually, he changed his mind on that. But it was like, buddy, <laughs> you're not going to read the Bible better than the undivided church for 2,000 years, please. So it's the Bible authoritatively interpreted by the creed, the ecumenical councils. We'll talk about that later. The, the first and second ecumenical council produced what we know as the Nicene Creed and lived out in our lives distinctively by the liturgy foremost found in the Book of Common Prayer. So let me say that again differently. Well, I would say what, part of what makes us Catholic Christians in, in the broadest sense of the term Catholic is that we hold to scripture as interpreted by the creeds and the councils. But what makes us distinctively Anglican, the thing that defines us as Anglicans theologically is our liturgy. It's not an abstract set of statements, systematic theology. It's, it's, a, lived, it's a lived theology. And this is related to a very old venerable saying that, that some of you may have heard before which is Lex Orandi, anybody know the second part? Lex 
could then be. As, the, as you pray, so you believe. Or, or literally, it's just the law of praying is the law of believing. But what it means is the way you pray is the way you believe. So our belief is we, we express through prayer. Um, and, and in Anglican circles, then, when you're trying to figure out, well, what do we believe as Anglicans? Of course, you're discussing the Bible. But ultimately, the, 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 um, not ultimately, that's the, totally the wrong way to put it. But as Anglicans, the sort of the grid through which you, you live out your theology and through which, through which scripture comes into your daily life is not a systematic theology. It's a, it's a set of liturgies. Um, and then this is connected also to a third phrase that's, that's less commonly attached, but I think is also worthwhile, which is lex vivendi, the law of living, or the way you pray is the way you believe, is the way you live. And, yes, yeah, so Father Grant said, this is actually, it is, on the one hand, it's a directional thing, and we would actually say that the liturgy is at the heart, uh, and it is the, th- it is the font of, of, of belief and, and living. But on the other hand, what Father Grant was just saying, is that how you live actually shapes how you pray. So if you stop living faithfully, you will stop praying. I mean, it's just like, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you, you stop living for Jesus and eventually you'll stop praying for Jesus. It's not, um, not really that complicated. And then you'll stop believing. So uh, for the other thing to say is that for Anglicans then, our theology is not, is not just or even or primarily something you work out intellectually. I sort of grew up in a, in a tradition that talked about justification by faith alone, but sometimes it was justification by rightly understanding justification by faith alone. Sometimes it was like we're saved by properly understanding the theology of being saved rather than a living faith in Jesus Christ. And so the Anglican tradition does certainly do systematic theology, but it's a way of living sort of organically through the liturgy together communally. All right, I, um, so this is supposed to go for an hour, so I got 10 minutes left, so we better get going here because I'm running out of time. Uh, okay, so we've been talking about, so we're still talking about the uh, colic for purity here. We mentioned the set prayer thing. I think historically, what else might be interesting about this in the history of the church? Hmm, this is a really terrible leading question. What language is it in? Let's just do this more, more directly. It's in English, right. This was uh, first, so this appeared first in, in the first Book of Common Prayer that was ever compiled in 1549, so uh, 470 plus years ago, they can put together the first book of common prayer. What that was, we'll talk more about this next time, is um, a, some of the prayers were written during the, that time for the book itself, but for the most part, it was a compilation, an edited compilation of, of Latin liturgies and a little bit of Greek that was starting to come into the West. So Thomas Cranmer, who's the single most important person who put it together. Uh, sometimes he's called the author of the Book of Common Prayer, but that's really not true. He's the editor and compiler. He did author a lot of the prayer, a number of the prayers, but most of them already existed, and he either just translated or translated and edited or, and compiled them into one book. So this is back in the 1549. It's word for word. You can go look at the 1549. It's the exact same words, spelled differently, but other than that, it's the same words uh, that they are today. So the neat thing about it is that, is that this is still part of our tradition, and we've been praying this same prayer word for word for 470 plus years. I did not say that, but yes. So, yes. So, so this is a translation of a prayer that goes back to, at the latest, the 10th century. So the 900s AD, 8900. And so... Um, we have been praying it as in English for 770 years, but it existed in Latin prior to that for five, 600 more years at least. And we don't, it could be older than that, it's just we know it exists in the 900s. It's a translation. So kind of the amazing thing, which you all probably know, is that before that, before this, before the 1549, almost all of the service was in Latin, and it if you just went back like 50 years, the whole service would be in Latin. They translated a few things like the litany before that. So this also would have been just about the first thing. I'm not really sure. I'd have to go back and look at the 1549. 
Uh, maybe the Our Father would have been before it, I'm not sure. But this would have been one of the very first things you would have heard in English if you went to your first sort of Englishly mass translated into English. And how amazing, just to think about, that it would have been in inscrutable Latin for your entire life, and then you would have heard English. So what does that tell you about the Anglican tradition? It tells you that it is a tradition that went through the Reformation. Now everything's in English. The Roman Catholics uh, in, are in English, but that's relatively recent. 100 years ago, they wouldn't have been. We've been doing it for 470 years, and the Roman Catholics would probably do better if they just took our liturgy, and, which they are doing, actually, in some places, because it's better than theirs, but that's okay. I like to think of Vatican II in the, in the 1960s as, as, as when the Roman Catholics realized the Anglicans were actually right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway. So we're a church that went through the Reformation. We translated the liturgy into the language of the people, right? But it's a translation, which, which means that, that Cranmer and, and the various Anglican divines who, who were around during the Reformation, they didn't just make everything up um, whole hog and scrap everything that went before. The vast majority, vast majority, the majority definitely of the Book of Common Prayer is taken directly with some modifications from previously existing Latin rites. So there were two major ones. There was the Serum rite, which was most common in England, and then there was the Gregorian rite that was common on the continent of Europe. And he just pulled and compiled from those sources. He edited them often, and he changed things around, but for the most part, He's pulling things that already existed in the Western Catholic tradition. So people ask, is Anglicanism Catholic or Protestant? And typically the answer is yes. I don't like that answer. That's, that's true histori historiographically. Um, but I prefer theologically to say that we're a Catholic tradition that went through the Reformation. So we were reformed in certain ways during the Reformation. We are fundamentally Catholic. And we'll talk more about what it means to be Catholic later on. Of course, a lot of other Anglicans, some Anglicans are rolling over in their graves, and some of them are, don't know why they're suddenly angry at their computer desks or whatever. Um, not all Anglicans would agree, is, is what I'm trying to say there. On that note, which, oof, just a few minutes left, I called this class um, the Introduction to the Anglican Tradition. Last year, it was called Anglicanism 101, which is you know, the more common one. So Anglicanism 101 was the old one, and I changed the name. There's a few reasons I did that. I actually wanted to change it to Introduction to the Tradition of the Anglican Church. But, oof, that's not great sounding. Anglicanism 101 has this nice punchy, like it's very short, it's very catchy, you kind of know what you're getting into. Whereas if I'd called it Introduction to the Tradition of the, Ang or to the, tradition of the Anglican Church, that would just be sort of annoying, right? So I settled on introduction to the Anglican tradition. So the last thing I want to say is that, is that what do you think is the significance about me wanting to call it the Anglican tradition or the tradition of the Anglican church versus Anglicanism, do you think? For me, Anglicanism is fundamentally like a historical or sociological or cultural term. It's like a cultural set of practices, a theological political settlement between church and state, a, um, um, a way of organizing things that a sociologist or a historian could study kind of analytically and describe. And in that sense, and I'll try to explain that a little bit more because that's maybe not the clearest way to say it. In that sense, you can say that Anglicanism, and I think you really should say that Anglicanism was invented in the 16th and 17th centuries. And some um, other Anglicans would say that, that it was invented and the tradition was frozen in the 16th and 17th centuries. So when they ask, what does it mean to be an Anglican? If you're citing something from before the middle of the 1500s or after the 1600s, they would just think that's totally irrelevant. To be authentically Anglican means to be living in the 16th and 17th centuries. And, it's, and I would say Anglicanism was, in fact, invented in the 16th and 17th centuries. But what wasn't invented in the 16th and 17th centuries is the tradition of the Anglican Church. And the Anglican Church is, this is a little bit anachronistic because Anglican as a term comes in in the 1800s. But it, Anglican is just a way of saying English. And so the tradition of the Church of England, that's not invented in the 16th and 17th centuries. And, and the, the 
when you go read the Anglican reformers from the 16th and 17th century, not one of them that stays Anglican, anyway, not one of them sees themselves as inventing a new church or inventing a new tradition. They see themselves as reforming the Catholic Church in England. And so their movement is one that is dramatically changing Anglicanism, and not always for the good, but it's not, that at no point did they say, oh, we're going to start a new church. We say this all the time. Henry VIII started a new church. Uh, no, he didn't. The, um, there was an existing church that was reformed. And if you wanted to pick a, a royal monarch to see as the founder of Anglicanism, it wouldn't be Henry VIII. It would be Elizabeth I, his daughter, who creates what we call the Elizabethan settlement. We'll talk about that more later at some point. But nonetheless, you could say that Anglicanism is invented by Henry VIII, his son Edward, his daughter Elizabeth I, and a series of Anglican bishops and liturgists and reformers in the 16th and 17th centuries. So you could say, yeah, it was born then, it didn't exist before then. But the Anglican tradition, or the, the tradition of the Anglican church, is founded, I would say, ultimately by Jesus Christ. That the church... Uh, of in England can trace itself back to the apostles. And if you go in the narthex and you take a left when you go inside, you can see Bishop Grundorf's line of succession. And at the top of it, you're going to, well, you do actually do see St. Augustine of Canterbury. We'll talk about him in a second. But you see St. Peter and St. James and a third saint whose name is, I'm forgetting right now. There are, you see the three, three of the apostles. That is, his line of succession goes back to the apostles who were commissioned by Jesus Christ himself. And so the church that the Anglican reformers saw themselves as reforming is, was founded by Jesus Christ. And you want your founder to be Jesus Christ, not Henry VIII, right? <laughs> Anglicanism is, is, is invented in the 16th and 17th centuries, whereas when we talk about the tradition of the Anglican church, we're talking about the, those churches, including our own, that trace their lineage, which really means their apostolic succession through their bishops, trace their lineage through the Church of England. And that goes back prior to the Reformation, all the way back to uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury, who uh, was commissioned by the Pope in um, the 6th century to go replant the Church in England. The Church in England had started in the 2nd century, within at, le at, at the latest. And actually, some people think it was already... Some people think that the Church of England already existed before St. John, the last apostle to die, died. Uh, but, it, but, but it certainly existed within 100 years of that. But when, when Rome started to crumble, the church retreated, and so a new missionary, Augustine of Canterbury, not St. Augustine of Hippo, the famous Augustine, he's the less famous one, he's named after the famous one. Uh, Augustine of Canterbury is sent to England to, uh, renew, to renew the church there. And the church of, all bishops who root themselves back into the Church of England draw themselves back to St. Augustine of Canterbury, who then I, was, I don't know who he, I, who, if he was consecrated by Gregory, I think he was, and then is then traced back to the apostles themselves. So if you look Bishop, at Bishop Grundorf's succession, on the, the fourth line is the line from Augustine of Canterbury. Does that make sense? So the tradition of the Anglican Church is the tradition of the Church rooted back through the Church of England all the way back to Augustine of Canterbury, from there back to the continent and eventually to the apostles of Jesus Christ. And that's all part of our tradition, which is way cooler than deciding your whole tradition is the 16th and 17th century. I mean, the amazing thing about, <laughs> about arguing with some of uh, these, these kinds of Anglicans is that their like, main source of theology is to go look up the really obscure 16th, 17th century Anglican divines. I might have to delete this after video because... If, I, if it gets posted, some people might be mad. But anyway, whereas we get to go all the way back to the apostles, I mean, they do too. That's not even fair at all. But anyway, yes. But, but you, what you can also say is that the Church of England had fallen out of communion with Rome occasionally over the thousand-year existence before the Reformation. And when Henry VIII split with Rome, it was a big deal, but nobody, like literally nobody, probably Henry included, thought that that was it with, with England and Rome. And it wasn't because under his daughter Mary, they went back into communion with Rome. And it wasn't until Mary died and her half-sister Elizabeth took over that, that communion was broken a second time and for good. So permanent, the, or at least until now, the permanent break with Rome occurred under Henry's daughter, not under Henry anyway. Yeah. 
So what we were going to do, if I had time, is, is do a quick timeline of church history, but I'll just narrate it in 10 seconds, which is, so the church is founded by Jesus Christ. It's a continuation of Israel, right? And the church stays, is united under Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean that they like each other. You've got Judas in the original 12, so it's not like you have a perfect union. But it stays fundamentally united until 451 AD when there is a break with some of what are called the Oriental Orthodox churches. Those are the Coptic churches in Egypt. They break over the Council of Chalcedon. So there is a disunion there, but everybody else other than the Copts agrees that the church is still fundamentally united. It's just that the Copts and the Oriental Orthodox have fallen out of communion with the rest of the church. 1054 is the Great Schism when East and West split. And from that point on, basically, already, already for hundreds of years, the East and the West were not communicating particularly well. Once the Roman Empire fell, really, uh, initially, there, there was broken communication between East and West. Even before then, there was some. And, but the final break doesn't uh, happen until 1054, and at that point, there's a real sort of divergence. So one of the interesting things in the Reformation is that um, a lot of the Reformers assumed that the Eastern Orthodox Church was basically like the Protestant Church. Uh, and they were, so a lot of them were interested in the East because they were pretty sure that if they started reading Eastern Orthodox theologians, they were going to sound a lot like Martin Luther, uh, or at least that was the hope, because they thought, ooh, that would be cool if the Eastern Orthodox Church were Protestant. It wasn't. But uh, the Anglican Church in particular has always been especially interested in the East for various ways. So 1054, there's a split, and then you get the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, which is where everything sort of explodes. Last thing to say, because I think a lot of times we in the West believe that there, we, even, even Protestants and Anglicans will say, okay, there's the Church of Jesus Christ, and here's the Roman Catholic Church, and there's this continuum, and then everybody else breaks off from the Roman Catholics. So you got the, the, the cops here, and the Eastern Orthodox here, and the Protestants there, and there's an assumed narrative that there's this consistent thing called the Roman Catholic Church that, that just kind of kept doing its thing, and everybody else left them. That's great Roman Catholic propaganda, for the record. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is a, is a genuine church of Jesus Christ, and so in a sense, just like us, they trace their lineage right back to Jesus Christ and the apostles. But there's, it's not that at the, in, at the Great Schism, there's a split where the East leaves the Roman Catholic Church. That's, of course, how the Roman Catholics would view it. The East would say it's the other way around. The West left. I would say, and I think the only like historically reasonable and theologically, more, even more theologically reasonable thing, is to say there's a genuine fork in the road. The East goes one way, the West goes the other way. When you understand that, then you understand that both have claims to continuity back to Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But neither has a perfect claim of continuity that cancels the other person out, the other side out. And that's really important for a variety of reasons. And then in the Protestant Reformation, there's again the assumption that Rome just kept doing what they were doing, and the Protestants said, well, we're getting out of there. Now, there's some degree of truth to that, but it's also the case that the, what's called the Counter-Reformation, which is really just the reformation of the Roman Catholic Church at the, in the Council of Trent, most famously, that this is also itself a split, that post-Reformation Roman Catholicism is different than pre-Reformation Roman Catholicism. There's continuity. I'm not saying, like, it's totally new, but there is again, I would say, a split. Post-Reformation Roman Catholicism is where you get, I think, what we would say is identifiably Roman Catholicism. So just like Anglicanism was invented in the 16th and 17th centuries, well, so was, I would claim, Roman Catholicism. Not the Roman Catholic Church, that dates back to Jesus, just like the Anglican Church. And the reason that matters is because Roman Catholics do an excellent job of consistently say, saying the other thing, and Anglicans and Protestants just go along with it. Does that make sense? They, they, they cede way too much ground. Whereas when you understand that this is new, and so what I, what I tend to say and, is that, that before that, you have Eastern Orthodoxy and Western Catholicism. That's sort of a little bit of a made-up distinction that I'm just sort of using, but I think it's helpful to think about Roman Catholicism coming into birth during the Reformation, just like the Anglican tradition. And so there's another split, and the Anglican tradition goes one way, and the Roman Catholic tradition goes another way. Um, but both retain their Catholicity fundamentally, um, and neither, I would say, has a, has a claim to being 
ultimately more authentically Christian than me. The classic line is, is that Anglicanism is a, is a middle way between different things. I don't love that way of thinking. Um, Bishop Chad likes to say that um, Anglicanism is the middle way between Rome and Constantinople. The classic line is that, is that Anglicanism is the middle road between Rome and Geneva. The, Geneva is the, the Calvinist Reformed tradition. And then there's some really Protestant Anglicans who say that Anglicanism actually is the middle way between Wittenberg, the Lutheran tradition, and Geneva. The, uh, so we're half Lutheran, half Reformed. Now there's a lot of, there, one of the things that's great slash annoying about the Anglican tradition is that Cranmer was absolutely borrowing from the Reformed tradition and the Lutheran tradition. So they're not totally wrong that we are a tradition that has marks of Lutheranism and even and, and Reformed Calvinism in a sense. Um, but, but, that's a, but that's a different topic for another day. So the main point here is to say, what we're going to think about here is the tradition of the Anglican Church, not something that was invented in the 16th or 17th centuries. It went through that, and this is a critically important time for understanding. And even though I'm, I'm critical of some of the things they did, their fundamental impulse, let's reform abuses, is absolutely correct. And the place they looked, the undivided church of, of, of the first thousand years, is where we should look too. It's just they didn't have as good information as we did, and they got a little aggressive sometimes here and there in, in what they reformed. But I'm profoundly grateful that we have uh, an English language liturgical tradition that's 470 years old instead of 70 years old, um, and likewise an English language Bible that's 500 years old, um, and, and therefore we have a richness to our tradition that post-Vatican II Roman Catholicism does not have, except when they borrow from us. I, I would say that Catholicity, capital C Catholicity, we'll talk about this more, is, is rooted in scripture, the creeds and the councils I already mentioned. It's also rooted in the sacraments and holy orders, or apostolic succession. And, yeah, it's the universal church, but that's, those are the, the, the sort of fundamental marks. And if a church has that, it's Catholic, and if it doesn't, it's ultimately not Catholic, or at least not fully Catholic. So yeah, Anglicans are Catholics too. The Lord be with you. Let us stand and pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity to come together and consider the richness of the Anglican tradition, the ways that we can learn from it and love you and worship you in it. We ask all these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.